I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May I speak only the truth this day and may only the truth be perceived. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. I'm going to presage this sermon by saying that I'm using a new software program to write my sermon. So if things seem a little rough or rougher than normal, um, it's, I'll, I'll blame it on that. How's that sound? Yes? Hello? Mic on? <laughs> anyway. Um, several years ago, March break of grade 11 to be exact, I participated in a week-long live-in adventure with about a dozen or so classmates and teachers. And this adventure was called St. Marie Among the Hurons in Midland, Midland, Ontario. I won't tell you exactly where I am, but I am in that picture circa 1981. And as someone who, especially in my primary school years, was fascinated with First Nations history and culture, it was in some respects a dream come true. Now, for those of you not familiar with this episode of Canadian history, In 1639, French Jesuits, including the later martyred and canonized Jerome Lallemand and Jean de Brébeuf, established a fortified mission in what we would now call Huronia, known to the local Huron or Wendat people as Wendake, the area surrounding Lake Simcoe and Georgian Bay. And they sought to evangelize and convert the people of the Wendat, the Huron Confederacy, with whom the French had an economic and military alliance. Indeed, scholars think that the vast percentage of the beaver pelts that made their way from New France to France in the 1630s were supplied by about 500 Huron or Wendat hunters. St. Marie was staffed by Jesuit priests, lay brothers, and men called Donné, men who donated their time, who worked as laborers, And some of them were more skilled, even working as carpenters and smiths. And then there were soldiers as well, although the Jesuit missionaries really didn't want the soldiers, for they thought that it would introduce to the local population the worst of European civilization. You see, St. Marie was meant to serve as a model European community to the local First Nations peoples. And through it, the Jesuits sought to spread the Catholic faith to New France. I'm not sure what you think or what I think about, well, I know what I think about this being considered a model European community, considering it consisted of only men. But the Jesuits, in the process of this mission, um, kind of spearheaded a new approach to evangelism. They contextualized the gospel to make it more relevant to the peoples that they sought to convert. Everyone here probably knows the Huron Carol, Canada's oldest Christmas carol, which was written by Father Jean de Brébeuf at St. Marie among the Hurons, probably in 1642. Now, the mission ran for about 10 years until 1649, when the Wendat, weakened by diseases like measles, flu, and smallpox, and also by internal divisions caused by their distrust of the French, and the conversion of many to Christianity were defeated and overrun by their traditional rivals, Now, I'm going to probably massacre this. Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, what the French called the Iroquois, particularly the Mohawks of upstate New York. And despite the Hurons or Wendat being more numerous in numbers, you see, the French would not sell firearms to their First Nations allies, but the Dutch, who were allied with the Iroquois at the time, would. Now, many people think that this... uh, this expansion was due to aggression and greed, to monopolize the fur trade, to have more access to more beaver pelts. It's amazing that that fashion drove all of this, fashion in Europe drove all of this. And Pat, perhaps greed was part of it, but it was also seen more recently as a strategy to assimilate other nearby tribes, to replace those who had lost by the great epidemics which uh, spread through the Great Lakes region in the 1630s and 40s. Many people think that the population of the First Nations nations that were in the Great Lakes region dropped by more than 50% during these times. For the Wendat, the Huron, their numbers actually dropped from about 25,000 to 9,000 
in the space of about eight years. Under attack and threat of attack, indeed eight of the missionaries that were at St. Saint Marie were martyred for their faith. The remaining Jesuit brothers chose to abandon St. Marie and they raised it to the ground instead of letting it be desecrated by warring parties. The Europeans returned to Quebec eventually and the Wendat survivors were dispersed. Some of them were incorporated into the Iroquois Confederacy. Some moved to the relative safety of Quebec and some, believe it or not, eventually ended up over the course of time in Oklahoma and Kansas where there are now known to this day as the Wyandotte people. The site of St. Marie lay dormant for about 200 years until excavations in the middle of the 19th century, with additional scientific archaeological work taking place in the middle of the 20th century. And in 1964, they rebuilt almost the whole thing as a, as a model, as a living museum, kind of like Upper Canada Village. And this is where I, 18 years later, come into the story. You see, each of us in this experience were given a role to play, either as a missionary, a lay brother, a donné, a laborer, a soldier, a native convert. And then in the process of this week-long live-in adventure, we would learn about that role, and each of us would play in that life of that community. If memory serves me correctly, you might think that I was a priest, but I wasn't. I was actually a laborer. Anyway, through this experience, I had the opportunity to do things that I would otherwise be unable to do. Eat beaver stew, for instance. The meat was donated by a local trapper. I actually ate to eat, uh, actually had the opportunity to eat beaver tail, not the one that you get on the Rito, but actual beaver tail. Believe it or not, the, um, um, the Europeans actually used it as a substitute for bacon because it's very, very fatty, but it's also very fishy. And then the last thing I had the opportunity to do was to sleep overnight in a longhouse in the middle of March. And the one thing that I learned from this is that in a longhouse, you need to keep the fires burning bright. Someone needs to stay awake at night, all night, to keep stoking the fire, or else you won't be able to see or breathe in the morning. Because a low fire is a smoky fire, and in a longhouse, despite the fact that the ceiling is so high, and the, the ventilation is actually not very good. And eventually, if you don't keep the fire burning bright, you see this ceiling of smoke coming down and down and down and down until you're about three feet off the ground. And for us, this is exactly what happened for the six of us that decided to sleep in the longhouse that night. Around 1.30 a.m., AM we all went running out of the longhouse smoking, gas gasping for air, eyes streaming because of all the smoke. Then the next day, the people who were running the, uh, the uh, live-in experience in the classes, we kind of had classes each day too, they actually explained to us that blindness was very common, especially amongst women who lived in longhouse cultures because of this very fact, from the constant irritation from smoke exposure. Most women, by the time they were 50, were blind. Now, it's interesting that something that was so common in times past, blindness, is actually relatively quite uncommon nowadays. Although I think they're making the, the writing on all the bottles of medication and stuff like that really, really small. Cause... But blindness, I think, is still probably fairly common in tribal communities and, where, and amongst the poor who do not have access to good medical care. But in the ancient Near East, in Bible times, blindness must have been fairly common. It's one of the most frequently mentioned medical ailments, ailments in the Bible. And there are, no speci there are specific laws recorded in the Old Testament prohibiting obstacles that might injure the blind. In Leviticus 19.14, for, for instance, it says, You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Indeed, there are many factors that could have contributed to this blindness as being fairly common. Poor hygiene, unsanitary living conditions, congenital diseases, illness, injury, and even a condition called neonatal ophthalmitis, 
where an infection, commonly a venereal disease like gonorrhea, is transmitted to a baby's eyes during birth. And this can lead to infection, which can ultimately lead to blindness. When our kids were born, immediately after birth, they received a single drop of antibiotics in each eye, specifically for this reason. So common was it that 10% of the babies born in Europe in the 1880s had, had neonatal ophthalmitis. 10%. That's the year that when they started putting a dilute, um, a dilute antiseptic silver nitrate into babies' eyes. And that dropped the infection rate down to 0.17%. For this, for this it kind of puts, a, for, for me, it kind of puts a new spin on John 9, verses 1 to 3, about the man who Jesus healed who was born blind. But blindness was also used through Scripture in many different ways, in different theological ways. Those who were blind were prohibited from the Lord's service as a priest or a Levite. They couldn't enter the temple. And it was improper to offer blind animals for use as a sacrifice because blindness could be seen as a form of impurity. It is also used as a sign of God's judgment. That's in Deuteronomy 28, 29. Or as a symbol of unbelief or ignorance or even as a moral inadequacy. Spiritual blindness in Scripture is a figurative way of defining the bleak and hopeless condition of sinful humanity without a Savior. In Matthew 15, verse 14, Jesus said of the Pharisees, Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Perhaps this is one of the, why one of the cardinal signs of the coming of the Messiah was the healing of the blind in both its physical and its spiritual dimensions. In Isaiah 29, verse 18, it says, In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. And in Luke 4, verse 18 and 19, Jesus, in announcing the beginning of his public ministry, read a passage from Isaiah 61 in the synagogue, which said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. Indeed, in John 3, verse 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And yet in Scripture, there's another aspect to the use of blindness, where those who are blind have perceptive prophetic powers and spiritual insight despite their physical disability. And this is the context of the story of Bartimaeus. Our gospel reading starts with Jesus and the disciples at, in Jericho, about eight kilometers west of the Jordan and 36 kilometers northeast of Jerusalem. Doesn't sound like very far, but if you're walking, you actually go from 1,000 feet below sea level to 3,000 feet above sea level. You literally go up to Jerusalem. And Jesus and the disciples, as, law, uh, as well as a throng of pilgrims, are heading towards Jerusalem for the festival. Jesus, ultimately, to the cross. And Bartimaeus, which literally means son of Tamai, also has another meaning, which maybe reflects on what I just said recently. It also means son of uncleanness. And that we're told Bartimaeus was a blind beggar, sitting by the roadside asking for alms. Not an unusual sight. It's interesting the fact that Mark actually names him, suggests that Bartimaeus was a person that people in the early church knew. And if, there, if you want to follow along in, in a Bible, I, I want to unpack four things. It, this is a very short verse, but it's, it's got four very, I think, very... Um, in, um, can't think of the word I'm trying to say. Good points that I want to unpack here. So the first is from Mark 10, 46 to 48. Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus that was passing by. And when he heard that it was him, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
I think this is important at, on two levels. First, by identifying Jesus as the son of David, he's plainly stating that despite his physical blindness, he spiritually recognizes Jesus as the Messiah, something that the seeing scribes and Pharisees cannot see. In these three words, son of David, he is telling everyone who can hear him that Jesus, like David, is God's chosen instrument for bringing healing and blessing to the land. But as the crowds try to shut him up, he cries all the louder. We aren't told why they tried to shut him up. Was he just being a nuisance? Were they being dismissive of him because of his disability? Or was his cry that Jesus the Messiah too politically charged? They didn't want to get in trouble with the authorities. Son of David, have mercy on me, he cries. This is the cry of the downtrodden to God, the cry of the afflicted to God. Psalm 51 and elsewhere, in, especially in the Psalter, says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. To call Jesus by name and as his identity as, in his identity as the Messiah, Bartimaeus is expre expressing a profound faith in him. He is acknowledging despite his blindness, his physical blindness, Jesus' true identity. And this is in spite of what society, those around him, yelling at him to keep quiet, or his circumstances, his disability, are telling him. New American New Testament scholar James Edwards says this, The kingdom of heaven, it has been said, is not for the well-meaning, but for the desperate. Bartimaeus is desperate. And his desperation is a doorway to faith. And then if we look to Mark 10, verses 49 to 50, we see Jesus' call to him, his compassionate call. Jesus, Jesus, earnestly heading toward Jerusalem, stopped. Not just himself or, just, or his disciples, the group that was following him. He stopped the whole entourage. And he said, call him. The response of Jesus is dramatic focused, and decisive. The Son of God, just think about this, the Son of God on his way to the cross stopped to heal a blind man. So much does God love us. When we earnestly seek him, he will respond to our needs. Indeed, in Isaiah 65, verse 24, it says this, Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. My brothers and sisters, we can have confidence in this. If we call to God, if, if we call to God, he will answer. That's what this book is all about. And this leads to what I think are probably the most powerful, I, at least I found them the most powerful passages, powerful words in this whole passage. Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And notice what the response of Bartimaeus is. His response is equally dramatic, focused, and decisive. He casts aside his cloak, and he comes to Jesus. If you read back in Mark, in Mark 8, it says uh, in the story of the rich young man, notice the difference. The, the rich young man went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. For Bartimaeus, his cloak was not just something to keep him warm in cold weather or cool evenings. It was everything for him. It was what he used to beg. You see, what beggars would do is they would put their cloak out in front of them, kind of like what modern panhandlers would do with a little coffee cup, Tim Horton's coffee cup or something like that. This is what they used to collect alms. It was the tool of his trade. But it was also symbolic of what kept him in bondage. And when Jesus called, he cast it aside for it to become an encumbrance to him, a symbol, of not what he, a symbol of what he was, not what he was to become. And then if we move on to Mark 10, 51, verses 51 to 52, Jesus asks him a question. What do you want me to do 
for you. Does anybody remember where we heard that last? We heard that last week. And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, Master, let me recover my sight. We heard this question last week from James and John. But here is the difference between Bartimaeus and James and John. Bartimaeus wants to see so he can follow Jesus. James and John want to sit with him in glory. His response in faith identifies Jesus as the one who can grant sight to the blind through his grace and his power to heal. Not just the physically blind, but those in spiritual blindness as well. To reverse God's judgment on sinful humanity and to cure our unbelief, our ignorance. And so Jesus, what does Jesus do? He heals him. And then finally, there's a call to action. Notice what Jesus says to Bartimaeus. Go your way, your faith has made you well. If you think about it, go your way, that's actually a test. Jesus is asking Bartimaeus, what are you going to do now? He's challenging Bartimaeus to choose between self and God. And what does Bartimaeus do? He follows Jesus. For I think he recognizes, despite his previous uh, physical blindness and his lack of, of uh, well, sorry, what was I going to say here? His healed physical blindness and his spiritual uh, perception, he recognizes that the only way is Jesus. Returning back to James Edwards, Jesus has transformed Bartimaeus from a beggar beside the road to a disciple on the road. Faith that does not lead to discipleship is not saving faith. Whoever asks of Jesus must be willing to follow Jesus, even on the uphill road to the cross. So as I come to a conclusion, I believe this story of the healing of Bartimaeus, where he transformed a blind beggar sitting beside the road to a disciple following Jesus on the road. This teaches us some important lessons. I want you to think about these questions how despite our physical blind, our spiritual blindness, despite our trials and tribulations, despite the sometimes overwhelming noise of those around us in our families, in our society, in our culture, when we persistently and confidently recognize and call out to Jesus for who he truly is, the Son of David, the Messiah, the Son of God, we have confidence that he will respond to us in our need. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. So I have a question for you. How can acknowledging Jesus' true identity as Bartimaeus did transform our approach to faith? It makes us ask the question, who do we think Jesus is? And that will dictate what our faith looks like, what the nature of our faith is. And then there's the response of Bartimaeus to the call of Jesus. Take heart, get up, he is calling you. What barriers might prevent you from recognizing and pursuing Jesus? Similar to Bartimaeus casting aside his cloak. What cloaks do you need to cast aside in order to pursue a deeper relationship with Jesus in more earnest and then ultimately this question, and I asked this question last week, Jesus asking us, what do you want me to do for you? To which Bartimaeus answers, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. In what ways do you feel spiritually blind? And how can you actively seek Jesus like Bartimaeus? And finally, there's the ultimate response of Bartimaeus, how he follows Jesus. C.S. Lewis, in describing the impact on Jesus to everybody who he came in contact with, wrote this. He produced mainly three effects, hatred, terror, adoration. There is no trace of people expressing mild approval. So do you seek Je Jesus for your own benefit, like James and John, to go your own way, to be seated with him in glory only? <laughs> 
Or do you seek Jesus to follow him on the road to the cross? This brings us full circle to where we started. What role would you take up at St. Marie among the Hurons, despite the danger? Would you even be there at all? I preach this all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.